Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the presence after the rain, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's something about that name. Thank you for joining me with that song. Bill Gaither did us a great favor when he wrote that uh, particular lyric and music. What a difference it makes when we stop and think about Jesus the King. And we're going to be talking about him in our lesson tonight. I want to again express my appreciation for uh, the invitation to be here. It's been a joy to know uh, Corey over the last uh, several years or many years and to be able to uh, have a friendship with uh, him. And when we got here, we found we had lots of friends from various walks of our life. And what a joy it's been to see uh, so many. And uh, I just want to commend you uh, as a congregation to remain strong and faithful in serving the Lord and continuing in great activities which uh, make a difference in the lives of uh, all of this community as you are salt and light and leaven in this world. And uh, thank you very much for allowing me to come and to be with you. Well, we've been looking at Old Testament kings, and there was a mentality that came to me when I began to look at Saul and David and Solomon, that I thought, well, there's something we need to, to stop and think about when we begin to think about King Jesus. When that first gospel sermon was being preached by Peter in Acts chapter 2, when he gets down to that final sentence that we have recorded in our text, verse 36, he says, This Jesus whom you crucified has been made both Lord and Christ. And at that very moment, the audience, whether Peter was finished with his sermon or whether the audience interrupts his sermon, we don't necessarily know. But the text tells us the people were cut to the heart. And they cried out asking the most significant question, men and brethren, what should we do? What response should we make to that which has transpired? And of course, the answer that was given to them was to repent and be immersed, every one of them, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of their sins. They would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And such begins the gospel story. Such begins the New Testament age for us to be involved in so that you and I can have an opportunity to be in Christ and walk in Christ and hopefully one day hear those words well done good and faithful servant enter into the joy of your master because 
As our lesson objective is stated, only salvation and hope are found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are so many voices in our world today. Voices that are crying out, demanding our attention. Voices that are trying to dissuade us from a Christian walk to walking in some other pathway. But may I suggest to you that you and I, if we really want to have a wonderful, abundant life, are going to be single-minded in purpose, keeping our eyes fixed upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, looking to Him. Well, the Apostle Paul is probably one of the greatest preachers that has ever been, not because he was necessarily eloquent, but because he was chosen for the purpose of preaching that message, especially to the Gentiles. And in his course of action, as he was involved with the people around him, he comes in contact with two what we call young men. We don't really know their ages. I have the feeling that Timothy was maybe 30, 35. Uh, Titus, possibly about the same. But he writes letters to these two young men, two to Timothy that we have in the text and one to Titus. And they're letters of encouragement. I want you to be a preacher. I want you to share the message. I want you to have the gospel so deep within your heart and your life that you will never, ever turn away from that gospel message. And so to encourage the young man Timothy, as he closes the first book, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13, it's on your sheet. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion forever. Amen. Well, as you begin to read that passage, there are several phrases that to me just kind of, kind of pop out. One is the consistency of God and God's message through Jesus Christ. Even since the time that our Lord was before Pontius Pilate, who was really kind of wishy-washy on the whole situation of what should happen to Jesus, Jesus makes that good confession, Paul says. And he says that the challenge for us, verse 14, is that we could keep the commandment without stain or reproach. This is kind of an interesting phrase, the way it's said, because it's in the singular. Usually when we talk about the commandments of God, we put it in the plural, do we not? But Paul is saying to us that this body of information that we have been given in terms of the gospel it is singular in nature. It is unified totally in nature. It is the commandment. And so when he's saying you keep the commandment, you keep the commandment. Why? Because the commandment is what's going to make the difference in your life. It is that message that turns you from darkness to light. 
It's that gospel news, that good news that takes you from being someone who's struggling to someone who has an ultimate victory always before them. And so he uses the singular, but he's telling us that's what the gospel is. And you want to do that until the Lord returns again. Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to come at the proper time. And what about this Lord Jesus Christ? He who is blessed, and he's the only sovereign. That word sovereign means all-powerful, having all control, all dominion. Satan tries to wrestle us away from God. Satan tries to take us away from the cross. But really, the only power that, that, that is of significance is the power of Christ. The victory that he gives us. And so because he is that sovereign, he is the king of kings and Lord of lords. Notice the capitalization there. Isn't that kind of interesting? If you haven't ever paid any attention to that, capital K. Capital K tells us that this is a very significant personal title that's been given. One that embodies all of the majesty. There's all sorts of kings. Lord, capital L, of lords, little l. And he's the one who possesses immortality. He's the one who gives us the life that cannot be overtaken by physical death. You remember that great passage in John chapter 14, verse 6? I am the way, the truth, the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Beautiful thought about this King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he says, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Well, if you were with us on Sunday night, we began with a little bit of a study, just a few minutes of study concerning the concept of a king. And I thought that it was very important to do that because we were going to be looking at three earthly kings in Israel's lifespan. And then we were tonight going to look at the ultimate king. And so we needed to have a little bit of a working knowledge, a working insight of, of what's all involved with this king. We don't have that in America. So maybe we don't have as good a picture as they do, say, in England or some other country that might have an, uh, a monarch of that nature. Well, we said three things about this king. The earliest biblical usage of this title, king, denotes an absolute monarch who exercises unchecked control over his subjects. When uh, <clears throat> the man comes to David, King David, as we studied the other night, and he has the news concerning Saul's death. And David says, tell me the story. And the guy says, well, I came upon him and he had fallen on his sword. And he was in great agony and great pain. And he begged me and he begged me, kill me. And so I did. Do you remember what David did right then? Well, first he chastised him. He says, you shouldn't have treated the Lord's anointed that way. But then the next thing he did is he looked at one of the armament that was beside David, and he said to him, slay him. Bang, just like that. No judge, no jury, no nothing. 
That's the power that the king has, and any type of king has. He is an absolute monarch. He exercises unchecked control over his subjects. I just give you that one illustration. There's multiplicities that we could give out of the life of Solomon, <clears throat> out of the life of David, and out of the life of Saul, all of them. And this sense of title is applied both to Yahweh, that is God, as well as human rulers. Now stop and think about that for just a moment because I think it's an, an important thing when we get to the idea of Jesus being the King of Kings. <clears throat> Absolute control. Absolute control over his subjects. This Jesus whom you crucified, Peter said, you remember we quoted that a few moments ago, God hath made both Lord and Christ. And there's no constitutional obligations laid upon the ruler, nor were any restrictions put upon his arbitrary authority so the king can do what the king wants to do. Well, as I was rethinking this yesterday and a little bit the day before, we've looked at three earthly kings. Ask yourself the question in light of what we've just said, what type of kings were they? Were they always interested in providing for their subjects' best interest? One of the things I observe about Saul and, and, and David and Solomon, it seems, is they had a little bit of a selfish streak to them. Uh, they were pretty concerned about what went on with them, what sort of relationship they had going on, what sort of power and ability was theirs. They weren't always looking out for the best interest of their subjects. Go back to the story of David and Goliath. We've used this as an illustration several times. If Saul had have had the faith he should have in God, number one, and number two, if he had have had the faithful confidence that God would give him the victory, David would have never had the opportunity to cast the stone in his slingshot and bring Goliath down, because Saul would have done it. But he wasn't looking out for what was best for his people. He was concerned about how he was going to live with the Philistines there and Goliath making a challenge. Were they always interested in providing for their subject's best interest? Even a greater question, were they meek and merciful? To their subjects. Well, we really didn't delve into that too much, but I put that question there because when you begin to contrast that which we have as the earthly kings and the king of kings and lord of lords, you're going to see a very distinctive difference. You're going to see Jesus being described as meek and exemplified as meek. You're going to see Jesus as being someone who has the best interest for those who are in his kingdom that a monarch can possibly have. We're going to say this again in a few moments, but I'm going to put it in right here too. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Which leads to the third question, what type of king do you want over your life? You want someone that's merciful? Do you want a king that is interested in your welfare and the type of life and the possibilities that you might have as far as life is concerned? I'm thinking so. I'm thinking so. I want a king who can call me by name 
and who looks at me with tender compassion and he says, you know, you're not exactly what you ought to be, but I would like to perfect you by my blood. I would like to give you insight into the best life a person can possibly have. And most of all, when this life is over with, I want you to come home and be with me throughout all of eternity. And to make sure that you have the possibility of doing that, I'm willingly going to surrender myself. And he did. I know that you've heard Isaiah 53 a multiplicity of times, maybe myriads of times. When I think about the Christ, I, I, I am just always drawn to Isaiah 53, probably first and foremost, and I'll tell you why. Because when you look at the monarch that came to us, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he is so different from every other king that you read about in secular history or biblical history. It's just almost mind-blowing. I don't have every verse down here. I just have a few of the verses. But I want you to stop and look at these things that are said about the King of Kings in Isaiah chapter 53. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Say you were living when Christ was alive here upon this earth and you were to be in a crowd with Jesus, do you think he would have stood out? I used to think so until I spent some time with this passage and I don't think so. I think he just pretty well would look like just almost any one of us. Nothing unique. He was just common. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. You just can't read those words without having some sort of feeling within your mind and your heart, and maybe even at times when you read it, it brings tears to your eyes. To think about the king who came to this earth for you and for me. Our griefs he bore, our sorrows he carried. We didn't necessarily accept him. In fact, far too many reject him. But yet he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. In the words of a song that we sing with our teenagers quite a lot, and I wish adults would sing it more often, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. Don't you love those words? Because they look at Christ and what he has done for us. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him by the scourging, by the lashes that he received, we find healing. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We kind of have a rebellious attitude about ourselves. 
We, we, we find it a little bit difficult to, to allow ourselves to become the doulos of God. That means someone who surrenders his own self-will intentionally to the lordship of another. That's a powerful phrase when Paul describes himself as he introduces the book of Philippians, the doulos of God. I had the right to be my own person and to try to captain my own ship, but I chose to give myself to Jesus, not to do any of those other things. Why? Because the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Do you see as you look at Isaiah's prophecy here, and Isaiah has more prophecy concerning the Lord than any of the other prophets do you see in this prophecy the stark contrast between Saul and David and Solomon and Jesus? Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. That's my Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the only sovereign. But now I would like for us to spend some time with some New Testament passages just to kind of cement within our minds and our hearts some of the things that we're trying to project here. Gospel of John chapter 1 is very pivotal in our understanding of who Jesus was and then what Jesus was willing to do. Have you ever read Genesis chapter 1 and you wondered about the, the we's and the us's there? What about the we's and the us's? Was God there by himself? No, there was the Word and there was the Spirit. And they're all one in three and three in one, and don't ask me to explain it. I can do as best I can, but I really can't do that good of a job. I, I wrestle with it. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Here's the Word. That which was spoken, and it was so. That, by the way, which we have written here. I want to go on a tangent right now, but I better not. Well, let me go just a little bit, okay? I can't tell you how important I think this document is. I don't have to wonder about my God whatsoever. I don't have to wonder about what he wants me to do. I don't know what he wants me to have because he has chosen to give it to me right here. Cherish. Cherish this written word that you have. Cherish this written word that you have. But what happened to that word? Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Can you imagine what it was like to have been with God in heaven? And God says, you know, I need someone to go to the earth. If it had been me, I would have said, well, you know, send whoever you'd like to. Isn't that what Moses tried to say to God? Send the message by whomever you will, send him by another. Yeah. 
Those people are mean down there. I, I, I don't know whether they would really be too interested in what I would have to say, what I would have to share with them. They might throw rocks at me. They might spit upon me. I, I don't know whether I'd want that life. But what do we see in our Lord? He came. He became flesh and dwelt among us. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows, Matthew chapter 1. Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Before they had come together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Boy, that raised some auspicious looking circumstances. Joseph has a problem. It looks like he isn't a very good man. Mary doesn't look like she's a very good woman. And yet the bottom line is, because this is God's action for our benefit to bring us about a king, Joseph has to face some starch realities. Verse 19, he planned to send her away secretly. He didn't want to embarrass her. He didn't want to be embarrassed. He thought, well, I'll just get her out of the country and, and that'll solve all the problems. But then the angel of the Lord appears to him. And says, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. This is God's action. Bringing about this child. And he has the most important, the most noble mission and goal that you could possibly, possibly have. Verse 21. If you haven't memorized verse 21 of Matthew chapter 1, can I challenge you to do so? It is such a pivotal verse in, in our thinking about spiritual things and especially salvation. It is right there at the pivotal point. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I don't see Saul having that attitude. I don't know, even though David was a man after God's own heart, that I see David having that attitude. I know Solomon didn't have that attitude, but Jesus did. Jesus came and looked at those who were lost, and who all is that? Everybody that's ever been. And as he walks down the street and they pass by him, he says, I want you, 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 I want you. He can't say it fast enough as the people walk by. I want you. He will save his people from their sins. Well, for us to look at this kingship attitude of Jesus for just a moment and kind of continue to put it in, into play. I want you to think about this setting that we have in Matthew chapter 18. He's just talked about the little children. He's kind of pointed to them. And then he begins to talk about his attitude toward those who are found in this lostness. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Powerful words. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? And if it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. How far... Is Jesus willing to go for you? 
Because you see, he wants all in the fold. Everyone in the fold. He's willing to leave the 90 and 9 who are safe and go out and search for the one I think the heart of Jesus along this line is kind of illustrated by the the story of the starfish that's washed up onto the beach. As the story goes, there were just hundreds of starfish that had washed up on the beach and a man was walking down the beach and he was picking up one after the other and he was throwing them back into the water. And someone said to him, you know, that's kind of a useless process. You know you can't save all of them. You know that not all of them are going to, to, to be able to return to the water. And he says, yeah, but I made a difference for this one. <laughs> As he threw another one back. I'd like to think that I'm the one <laughs> that Jesus was throwing back into the ocean. He made the difference for me. I might have been that one when the 90 and 9 were A-OK. -okay. And I'm glad we sang the song tonight with the kiddos about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree, the Savior for to see. And as the Savior came his way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Hey, Zacchaeus, what are you doing up there? I'm being liberal with the text, aren't I? And the song. I'm coming to your house today. You know, you look at old Zacchaeus, here's the tax collector. Anyone here work for the IRS? Raise your hand before I go on. I just want to make sure. I've known two IRS agents in my life. Met them both at church, by the way. It wasn't because I was in trouble. Oh, I hope I don't meet three. And one of them told me, he says, you know, I'm so glad that you said hi to me. He says, People don't really like to talk to me. I said, well, you know, when you're a tax collector, what can you expect? He said, I'm in the accounting part of the IRS with computers. I don't even talk to people. But when I tell them I'm with the IRS, you know, that was old Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was an outsider looking in. And boy, when Jesus comes and says, I'm going to your house, two things happen. A difference is made in Zacchaeus' life, and the criticism really comes toward Jesus. But as king of king and lord of lords, he was concerned about Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus shows a repentant attitude. Lord, I'll restore four times anything. Something happened in Zacchaeus' household. And the critics, the critics needed to be silenced. And how does Jesus silence those critics? For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I love a cappella quartet music. I buy it wherever I can find it. Sue can tell you right now that on our uh, hutch, there are about 47 CDs stacked up because I was looking for music for memorial service yesterday. Was able to find every song but one, and I found it on the internet, and I think I found a new group that I really, really like, and so I'm going to buy that whole thing here soon. One of the a cappella recordings I have is from a group that usually sings with the instrument. It's called the Cathedral Quartet. And the one song that they sing that moves me the most is there's room at the cross for me. And the phrase in that song that moves me, though millions have come, there's still room for one, there's room at the cross for me. Jesus at Zacchaeus' house 
says that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. I don't see a single phrase in the life of King Saul or King David or King Solomon in which they were concerned about someone's lostness. Now I keep making that point because I want you to see that there is a difference between those kings and the king of kings. And the difference concerning the earthly and that which is leading us to the spiritual. That which is leading us to the throne of God. Sometimes I almost feel a little bit redundant because there are so many passages in the New Testament which talk about Christ's purpose, talk about why he came to this earth to be that king. But one of the things that you'll discover with every one of those passages, even if there seems to be some redundancy, is there's just a little bit different twist, a little bit different mentality that's given to you that says, hey, look at Jesus anew and afresh again and again and again. So if I get a little redundant over the next few minutes, will you just please forgive me? But I think there's something every time that phraseology is used that the writer tells us just a little bit something different. Jesus says, John 12, 46, I've come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. I have come as light into the world. I wish that we had have had the time during this week to, to read more broad accounts of Saul's life and even David's life and Solomon's life. We did get a little bit of capsule of some of the things that were said. But one of the things that always strikes me as I read from First and Second Samuel through the Kings and the Chronicles is that even though God was in his heaven and he was concerned about the story continuing so that Christ could come, even though that was the case, the world sure seemed dark. So much adversarial relationships, so many problems just living life. And then you get to the New Testament and you begin to read the story of the birth of Christ and then you begin to read the account that we have of his early ministry. And you begin to see how Jesus interacted with people and how he showed his love and concern for people on a one-on-one basis. And you begin to read a phrase that says, I've come as light. And you say, oh yes. Oh, yes. And so when he heals the sick, when he raises the dead, when he does good things to people who probably weren't deserving, you begin to see it as light. And I have come as light so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. Jesus says, if anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I did not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. I've been told I use this word way too much, but I'm going to use it tonight. Wow. Wow. You talk about something phenomenal happening. The King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. Came to save the world. Now, if you read the rest of this passage and the verses before verse 46 that I have here, you come to understand how powerful the message of Jesus is. 
because he's not speaking of his own volition. He's speaking the words that the Father has given to him. And so you can know what the Father wants. You can know what the Father is seeking in your life. Because Jesus used his words. Well, Acts chapter 9 is a powerful, powerful part of the book of Acts because there's a fellow by the name of Saul who we come to know as Paul the Apostle who's on the road to Damascus and all of a sudden he finds himself not able to see. And the words pour down from the portals of heaven, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who art thou, Lord? He goes into the city. Ananias, the messenger, comes to him and tells him what God wants him to do. For Jesus. And notice that he is immersed into Christ. And then he begins the task. And the people are kind of in a quandary because the one who once persecuted is now the one who's preaching the gospel. Can we trust him? That's kind of the way they look at it. Can we trust him? But you begin to read the words that the Apostle Paul writes, and you begin to see a man who's converted and changed by the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a man who has has truly been to the depths of despair and now finds himself, even in adverse circumstances, walking in the light. So he writes to the young man Timothy, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Isn't that an interesting phrase? That Paul would say, do you know how great a sinner I was? Do you know how much I turned away from the gospel? From the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? How I was trying to persecute the way? I'm the chief of sinners. But then what did the king of kings do? Yet for this reason I found mercy. What type of a king do you want? You want one that's merciful? I do. So that in me as foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. That's the King of Kings. That's the Lord of Lords. That is the King who looks at us and says, I want you to be mine, and I'll prove it. I'll go to that cross. I'll go to that grave. I'll be resurrected from that grave and I'll ascend to the right hand of the throne of God. And when the accuser comes your way, when Satan comes before the Father and he says, you know what this guy did? Do you know what type of person he is? Do you know how horrible he is? Jesus leans over into the ear of God and says, that's one of mine. And Satan has to leave. We have that power, you know, get thee behind me, Satan. We have that power. Chapter 2, Paul can't get off this particular thinking. He says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. You mean he desires everyone to be saved? 
How do I know that? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Familiar words? Go therefore, make disciples, baptizing them. Oh my. Matthew 28 rings loud. Mark 16 reads loud. Go. Go. Go tell that message every place that you go that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, wants everyone within the confines of His kingdom. Some of our children, what we call children's songs, I, you know I've been a little critical of that. I've said most of these songs are adult songs. Jesus loves the little children. I, they sang it, I was sitting there and thinking, oh wow. Yeah, He loves us. Red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in His sight. Yes, he died for them all. He wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, when Jesus is praying that prayer in John 17 and he says, Sanctify them in the truth, thy word is truth. He's saying this is the pathway, the information that you need that will give you an abundant life. A life that may have many turmoils and, and tumultuous things happen, but a life that's going to be abundant while you walk in Him. I love the book of Hebrews. It's not because the book of Hebrews is telling us who is going to make the coffee. Did y'all catch that? I just, y'all were getting a little sleepy there. I need to see if you were awake. Yeah. He brews. I love the book of Hebrews because there is no other document in the New Testament, book of the New Testament, that shows you the contrast between the Lord Jesus Christ and especially the old law as clearly, as beautifully, as convincingly as the book of Hebrews does. And so you you find these contrasts starting with verse 1. There's contrast in verse 1 and 2. There's a contrast with Jesus and the angels and Jesus and Moses. And you just go on down the list, the contrasts are there. But then he becomes a picture of a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, we get a hold of him early in the book of of Genesis, king of Salem. And he doesn't have any genealogy and all this sort of stuff. And so we begin to see Jesus in his perpetual nature. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as the Hebrew writer tells us. And so you get to chapter 8, and Jesus as the high priest suddenly begins to take on an even greater significance to us. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. The Hebrew writer says, Jesus is at the right hand of God. And he says, he is a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched. Not man. You remember the tabernacle in the Old Testament? That was made out of goat skins and lumber and etc. and so forth. That they could pack up and carry with them. Someone asked me one time what happened to it. I don't know. I'm thinking because it was made by man and made with man. The materials that man has here upon the earth. It probably just 
became moth-eaten and rusted away. Don't know. But what I do know is that there is a true tabernacle. It is a tabernacle that has been built by the hands of God that is eternal. And Jesus is in that tabernacle. A minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. So when you start thinking about words such as preeminence and who has the glory and who has the most and who, who stands highest, the answer to your question for all of those is Jesus. Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Chapter 9, verse 11, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, not through the blood of goats and calves, but listen carefully, through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. If you want another verse that I think you ought to memorize, I think you ought to memorize this one. There's power in the blood we sing in the song. How do we know that? Because this verse tells us there's power in the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And he entered the holy place once for all. Because he was looking out for you. What type of king do you want in your life? What type of king do you want in your life? I tell you the type of king that I want in my life is what I see in Jesus. What I see in the Lord Jesus Christ. And knowing that he's there arguing my case before the Father. Knowing that when I am not what I need to be or should be. I repent, I ask for forgiveness, I receive it. Why? Because of that perfect tabernacle not made with hands in which Jesus entered into having obtained eternal redemption for us. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious Father, thank you for this night. We pray that the things we've shared together have been true and that they have been faithful to your word and that they have fallen upon ears who have listened and who want so very much to allow Jesus to be their king, to be their Lord, to be willing to surrender to him willingly, and submit to his way and to walk in his footsteps. Father, we can't thank you enough for Jesus. We don't have words to tell you how much we thank you. And because of him, we know of that eternal hope which we live in day by day here upon this earth. Thank you, Father, for loving us and for sharing with us your Son. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.